Theme. Yo, we're ready for Enterprise Month in Review. Brian's got fresh Dr. Pepper to try to soothe his calming nerves. <laughs> ready to rock and roll? Mm -hmm. I am at that. And um, it's been an interesting month. So, yeah, it uh, has. It has. And we have Maureen Blamford, special guest coming in 15 minutes. And she has got a lot to dispense on the problems of data and how it's creating sorry AI and how we can do better. She said she's going to bring some hope too. So this is cool. And we got lots of slides, Brian, this is going to be good. In fact, let's get the slide. Let's get the slide deck uh, up on stage here. Check it out. Ready to roll. Yeah. I just wonder why you always put that enterprise BS detector right above my picture on the, yeah. uh, you know, on the stream yard, but thank you for that. Thank you for your leadership, you know, because if there's That's one thing John right. Reed does, it's leadership, <laughs> leadership. And, uh, okay. So thank you. And on that, that note, mm -hmm. here's well, our here's our, data. yep. Here's our agenda folks. We're going to tell you what we think, uh, one of the cringy buzzwords, whatever that we heard this last month is all about. John and I are going to talk about what we think, um, are, you know, some of the more underrated enterprise stories that are out there. As John already alluded to, we're going to be, uh, we're actually blessed to have Maureen here today. She's probably going to hit us with some big, heavy, chewy, meaty thoughts and concepts. And um, I don't want to spoil her thunder. And then John and I, of course, we just can't do anything without bringing the snark. So we've got some humorous things there that... Um, what we're going to do is we're going to invite you in a little bit to the back um, CD door of uh, analyst stuff. And we're always trading little notes with each other about things that we see. And we'll share a couple of those with you then. And of course, we want all your comments, good, bad, otherwise indifferent, snarky, whatever. Throw them up on there. We'd love to see the comments. John. Yes. And hi, Thomas. And start your stream of comments and commentary, please, all. One thing I wanted to mention about our month in review is we've both done a lot of tarmac time. And one of the goals we have here is to try to reframe the narrative because vendors have their agendas on the keynote stage. Uh, and we know that the AI revolution is one of them, of course. But Wait a minute. John, have you heard about the transformative power behind generative AI? Yeah, it's automagical. <laughs> oh, in, right. in fact, I got a I got a thing about uh, today, a PR pitch about how Generative AI is going to solve Uber's problems with with customer satisfaction. Yeah, good luck. Mm. Anyway, so the point is, we get these narratives, but what we're trying to do here is to tell you what we think is worth tracking that you may not be hearing or different angles on stories. So with that in mind, let's whip through our top stories. First, we got cringy buzzwords over hype tech. Brian, what you got? Well... I like this one that actually showed up here. I think this was a fast company piece. I could be wrong on that. But they had that word right above where it says, why China? Uh, well, that word spamouflage, which I really think should be on the front of every vendor marketing piece out there. Um, but I thought it was such a good word that we need to share that and take that you know, out to the broader public. Thoughts? Oh, spamouflage, indeed. I've seen a little bit of that this spring. Uh, well, we'll go to the top stories. John, share your first couple of them here. Well, we got Joe McKendrick here saying we need critical thinkers to challenge AI. I thought that was a headline unto itself. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Did he write that article or did a Gen AI write that article? Well, that's a good point. Joe, are you out there to vouch for yourself? <laughs> Paging Joe McKendrick. Uh, yeah, so uh, I thought this was important because obviously there's a whole lot of stuff out there about uh you know ai making people smarter and better and and i think to some extent that can be true especially for junior employees who need more information at their fingertips but some really good quotes in here about the importance of perspective and critical thinking to ai results and that even skilled technologists and subject matter experts can fall fall into the trap of relying on too much on ai for their output so nice one joe uh, next up, Meta's AI chief LLMs will never reach human level intelligence. It's kind of a big deal, actually, because vendors have a tendency in our industry, Brian, to 
what they're doing is they're peddling uh, a commercial AI that is actually an imperfect product. And Meta's AI chief is Jan LeCun, who is one of the key players in the development of, of deep learning that laid the foundation for Gen AI. And so when I turn over to his pieces, I see a totally different narrative than I see from vendors. And I think it's important to keep in that, keep that in mind that a lot of the folks that originally developed this iteration of AI are unsatisfied with with the results and the maturity of it. And there's some really, really interesting quotes uh, in here. Uh, I'll just I'll just read you one really quickly about LLMs. This is Lacoon saying they're useful. There's no question about that. But on the path towards human level intelligence, an LLM is basically an off ramp, a distraction, a dead end. He goes so far as to say that five years from now there won't be like generative AI in the in the form that we know it at all. And so I think that's just really interesting because we need to keep in mind that that today's technology that is being hailed as revolutionary and life-changing is imperfect as per some of the folks that created. And Lacoon's not alone. Uh, Yashua Benjuo, who also won the Turing Award, uh, is working on the same kinds of things. And And so they're trying to solve these big problems. And one of the really key points here was actually exposed around the hum- humane AI pin uh, when it came out and people were finding, and that wasn't one of my whiffs this time, but people were finding that basically it it just isn't all that good in the real world. It, it was responding poorly. Uh, Google search was telling people what they were seeing in front of them because the pin is supposed to kind of provide you with this AI assistant that tells you what's going on in the world. And it's like, so yeah, people are just panning into the reviews and what Lacoon says is there are four essential characteristics of human intelligence, also animal intelligence that current AI systems can't do. And so it's the sensory aspects. So once you take an LLM and put it on a pin and wear it around Manhattan and ask it to like navigate the world for you, you find out that we have a long way to go. So anyway, I just think it's good to keep in mind, which is not to say that that enterprises can't do cool stuff with the technology in play. But there's a broader conversation going on right now, and that's sort of the point. And and Thomas has a comment on that. In five years, we probably have generative AI. These days, we have derivative AI. That's a different way of phrasing it, but about what I was saying. A ghostwriter? Yeah, perhaps McKendrick. Um, no, McKendrick doesn't use AI to write his articles. I'm t- i got to step in for Joe here. Anyway, Brian, I think those those are mostly my top stories. I just wanted to briefly call out Eric Kimberling because he wrote a piece on the dilemma of legacy systems, a strategic perspective, and I think this maybe sets up Marine's commentary pretty well. But one thing I really like about Eric is that he doesn't deny the reality of legacy systems in the enterprise. And basically, he's trying to say that, guess what? Companies aren't going to upgrade all their legacy systems right now. They're going to want to figure out how to communicate with them and work with them. And and he's like, don't just do change for change's sake. Good advice, Eric. Yeah, I saw that. And a couple of thoughts crossed my mind when that piece came out. One was, um, there's one vendor I've been just merciless about following up on their 70,000 on-prem customers and what's been happening to them. You know, I mean, these are these firms are running businesses, uh, you know, with this old code and it has it it has been extraordinarily uh, sticky and hard for these companies to give it up. So it's going to be there, you know, and uh, you're right. The market's always chasing the next shiny object. And that's that's an issue for sure. Um, The the other there was one other angle on that as you were commenting on this. the, the whole, the whole idea that um, we we should only be focused on the bright and shiny object troubles me quite a bit, because the discussion really should be around the value that's being delivered or not delivered, whatever, versus some of the disruption, the cost, everything else. Very few people actually talk about how much of a pain it is and how expensive it is to change these systems out. One of the biggest uh, chemical companies in the world, their CEO sat in front of me at a little audience deal, and he commented about how I had to go to the board and ask for a billion dollars when we put in this ERP stuff in the late 80s, early 90s. I don't want to have to go back there and tell them we need to spend another billion to upgrade the platform on it. 
So the ROI question, I think, is still a very valid one today as it's always been. Anyway, enough of that. Yeah, what indeed. A, so what, you want to move on to your picks? Yeah, yeah. What, what do we got? All right, let's month? see. Brian's top stories of the month. Yeah, this one really, this one got my attention. Um, the afterlife of data. Um, okay, so what's been troubling me about LLMs in particular and the data that companies use is I don't know that a company has the right, for example, to take employee information and put that into a training model or whatever for either its own AI tools or let a software vendor who wasn't, you know, part of this discussion, you know, have access to it as well. But then when you add this question about, and what happens when the employee is no longer with the firm or they die? Who gets to speak, if you will, for that person and the way their information is being used? And there's just some delicious um, ethical questions here. They're going to run in, you know, smack dab into the commercial considerations of some of these products that are out on the market. So I'm not, you know, this was, I read an excerpt about this book. It's just coming out. I don't know that it's actually fully available on the market yet. But I was reading about it on this MIT technology review piece, and I thought, we, I thought this is something we need to have more dialogue about. Indeed. In fact, uh, before this show, we were talking about this a bit and how even just opening up to a new region and the implications for that for regulatory purposes. And you may have signed off on certain agreements with vendors, but then, you know, they open up a different region with a more stringent. AI regulations and, you know, is your data accounted for in that? This is a lot of moving target type of stuff right now. So, yeah, I think if I were an attorney, although I can play one on TV, but if if I were an attorney, I would really want to be all over some of these um, software license and subscription agreements because this stuff is just going to make the average contract go from that thick to like that thick uh, when we start really trying to bulletproof things for both the user as well as the customer paying the subscription and the vendor, of course, want to put all their language in there. But I don't think we've even scratched the surface what's going to happen there. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just talking with you. Also, I have a friend at a firm. They're a big SI that has all their own LLMs internally, and they they think it's a big selling point that in their agreements, they can guarantee that customer data never leaves their domain. And he was telling me like, yeah, you know, if you, a lot of vendors are using external LLMs for some activities and they can tell their customers that their data is not going to become part of that training set. But at the same time, log files are being created and every prompt goes into log files. And these are the kinds of things, like you said, if I'm an attorney, I'm like, wait a minute, everything's getting recorded into log files. Okay, I'm gonna have a look at that. And uh, yeah, th these are good times for the legal profession, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, I see we got a couple of comments. There, okay. Yeah, we Thank got you. we got Jason coming in hot. Jason, good job. TCO ROI or otherwise, just need to continue looking at five to ten year transformation strategies and resulting value to the business versus shiny objects and go live day cost to acquire and implement too many plans, too few strategies. Jason. Well, I wonder, well, and to nice. Jason's point, uh, I'll pile on and say, you know, y yes. And um, I think one of the things a lot of clients, they get suckered into the fast implementation stories from software vendors when they should be thinking about dramatically changing, re-engineering, reimagining whatever their work processes. And, just because a vendor says something is a best practice doesn't necessarily mean it's a best practice for your firm or your industry. And in fact, you may want to think about doing something very novel, very unique, whatever, so that you can juice up the return on investment deal as opposed to just minimize the total co you know, cost of um, ownership. I, I hate it when people justify systems on TCO because they're basically just throwing up their hands and saying, I have no imagination. I can't figure out how we could really get value out of these purchases. I'll go so far. I'll go so far to, far as to say that TCO is dead at this point as a as a as a justification for a big project. Uh, Brian, we're almost out of time because we got to bring Marine on. Uh, you got okay. a couple more. We can come back to your top stories towards at the end too. 
Um, but anyway, can you whip through these this, really this, quick? This one's this one's twenty seconds. I thought this was hilarious. The juxtaposition on this article. We got a story. The main story is two companies, big companies, Samsung being one of them, are putting in a six day work week for executives, and it's of course raising concerns. And then the other story on the same web page is a company going to a four day work week, and look what it's doing to improve the employee experience, morale, and everything else. It's sort of like. Do these executives not know how to read or see what's going on here? I mean, this to me was just like, what an education in a printout right here. I'm sure someone is going to print this out and plaster all over these two firms. That's it on that one. All right. And then real quick. Uh, I just thought this was fascinating. Uh, uh, the guys at ZDNet, I used to do a lot of con contributions over there. So did John. But they ran a bunch of code tests of uh, asking Copilot to generate all kinds of different code. And uh, they had a, a very structured test. And unfortunately, Microsoft Copilot didn't fare that well. But chat GPT, surprisingly, uh, was the, the far and away clear winner on it, which I thought was an interesting story. I keep asking vendors about when are you going to use uh, Gen AI to start writing the code for your applications. And they keep, you know, poo-pooing that idea. But it looks like this is an area that's starting to grow in capability in, in very, you know, uh, big ways. That's it. Indeed. Code generation and quality on Gen AI is a topic to be returned to. But I don't want to delay our guest. Here we go. Maureen Blanford, welcome. <laughs> hey, guys. How are you? Good. Well, hopefully Maureen wasn't, you know, bored to death by the, you know, our prattling on here at the very beginning. I think I saw, I think I saw a reaction backstage when, when I, when I slammed TCO. <laughs> so. Yeah. And I was also thinking someone needed to get Brian a Dr. Pepper. And then I remembered that he had one already. Yeah. So that's, yeah, there's nowhere to go from there. Yeah. Well, you guys we are already cranky, bringing it. We got cranky, Brian. All right. Excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so just a little bit of con context uh, for for Marine. Uh, Marine has been on my video show for some deep dives in the past, but one of the reasons why I said we come back is because since that time, you've been hitting it hard and heavy with serendipitous with your clients on data projects, and so I really, really wanted to hear that on the ground perspective right now because we really have an interesting juxtaposition here where the enterprise customers are being told that they can really get a quality AI experience uh, with with better data through, you know, their own like data repositories and customer data. And then there's this whole question of how much does quality data really exist? And you're right in the middle of all of that because your products are based on that. So you you have some illustrations for us today. And it's really cool to read some of your quotes that you sent before you came on because you started out with something uh, kind of optimistic. You said you're a fan of purposeful, proper AI, so many good use cases. But Marina, all went downhill from there. You said uh, most enterprises aren't anywhere close to having what they need foundationally to make that work. Uh, you talk about spending most of your time comforting humans who are mortified that their data is in a terrible state. Um, there's some work to do out here. So can you just tell us a little bit about what you're trying to do with your clients. So you get a little shameless plug in here because we need to understand what you're trying to do and then kind of the framework for what you're starting to learn. And then we'll get into some of your slides too. Well, you know, it's, and it's interesting because I'll dovetail those, but, but one of the things I think is important for anybody who's criticizing AI is, is to just foundationally, there are some great use cases for AI. And because I think sometimes if you're criticizing it, you're looked on as a, as a, as a hater or you're not modern enough. But like, John, you've written about robotics. Aaron Levy just released a really cool sort of conversational AI thing. I've got a friend, Sarah Coward, who's doing some cool stuff. And I think, I think the use cases that have a known data set, a fresh data data set, I think that particularly applies in robotics, I think are great uses. But I think where we go awry is relying on these black box LLMs or enterprise data, which I'll get into in, in a sec. Um, so hopefully that resonates. We're going to concentrate on the, the downside, but that's not to say there's not some good stuff. So um, let me let me share um, a little behind the scenes. Um, we can throw up the Rube Goldberg puzzle, and I and I think what we're working on at Serendipitous in trying to help 
uh, enterprise B2Bs get their go-to-market data better, uh, I think it's also illustrative of what we're looking at with uh, with AI. So can we pop and, up? And uh, let me, uh, yeah, I will do that. Yeah. And let me just, let me just read this quote that you sent. You're going to show us today how our foundational tech is a Rube Goldberg puzzle plastered over with Band-Aid tech point solutions and then siloed. This is why no one's getting any insights out of our aging, decrepit, bloated vats of data. Wow. Okay. Was, that, I didn't there, really know that those were going to be like read out loud to the wow. cosmos, but you know, I'll stand by. No, them. no, no, that's no, but that's good. I mean, I think it's <laughs> Friday afternoon. People have been working hard this week. We need to wake them up a little bit. That's, that's caffeine, I would say for our users. So tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah. So, so kind of no one's fault, but anybody who's working in enterprise today, we've inherited these legacy systems, you know, so Eric acknowledging them. The biggest problem we all face today of the many problems is we are drunk on dashboards and we're not looking at the underlying data. So, Brian, to your point about old code and that's just going to be here, I also think that we need to be looking how data is structured and categorized. So we're all struggling with these Rube Goldberg underpinnings. And, John, to your point, nobody has the appetite to, you know, to be doing a rip and replace, right? So then. We, we've how we've solved for that today is we've plastered over uh, the digital infrastructure with a bunch of band aid tech, and we can pop up the band aids. So yeah, this is if you want. I just want to say, uh, okay, go ahead. Please, I, I this band aid slide is rated PG thirteen, so please, uh, this is going to be scary for some viewers to see all these band aids on their systems. But I just want to warn you, it's coming. Oh my God, look at that. Okay, so this, the, is, I, this is what you're working with. Ouch. So I got to jump in here. I learned an expression from the, the master, uh, Dan Howlett. He would see a slide like this, and his word was, he described it as the dog's breakfast. And I have, I have credited Dan on that countless times th thereafter. But that is exactly what's going on. And if I could add one more deal to it, uh, a couple of my clients, um, have those kind of problems because they grew through m a activities and one of them had so many different erp systems that their um they had a management consulting from one of the big 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 firms they came up with a new metric just for that client called erps per employee so they had the they had the data problems like you wouldn't believe and i could tell maureen's going to steal that so go ahead Okay. Well, it's it is as I have a little bit of PTSD just even when I talk about this and and I can relate to our clients in just the market, but I was on a panel with the VP of Marketo EMEA enough years ago that I'm that I'm not going to be shaming any one person. And Marketo, the marketing automation platform, six, seven years ago, actually internally was running, I think, six or seven marketing automation platforms. Because of the uh, <laughs> that that's thanks, Jason. But because of the the M and A and integration, I've been at other companies that have you know it's one company and they've got six, seven, eight you know Salesforce instances and the constantly trying to mash that stuff together. But I want to say one thing about point solutions that that I don't think anyone is talking about or or not enough. Every point solution is a band aid covering a gap in the foundational tech. And I haven't sworn yet, and I'm going to try not to, but every point solution also causes downstream gaps for which you need another Band-Aid point solution. And it's a nightmare. It is very difficult to get any sort of data um, and insights. We've got data. We can't get insights out of this stuff. It's just creating these, you know, blistering vats of data. And then finally, as we'll all know in B2B, and I'm sure it's this way in B2C as well, we're incredibly siloed. Um, so we've got this mess of an of an infrastructure that's been band-aided over, and then we're then we're just in silos. Uh, and so it makes it even harder to share insights. When we talk about sales and marketing aligning or the teams aligning, you know, the humans can't get unsiloed because of this data situation that we're in. Even if they even if they have the best of intentions, we don't have a digital infrastructure that works for them.
and just one more thing. Yeah, indeed. And just one more thing, Brian, I just wanted to mention, you spoke of your infamous ZDNet days. I just did a Google search on for, on your term Frankensoft that you coined. Oh yeah, for for the Frankenstein monster of 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 a software mess that companies are dealing with, and that that was 2012. And I, I wonder how much progress we've actually made. Hmm. I, um, I know I know I know a bunch of vendors keep ripping that off all the time, and I'm I'm still waiting yeah. to collect royalties. Yeah, you, you haven't made as many royalties perhaps on that as you should have. Um, so, uh, Jason said, not too bad. There's no blood coming through these bandits. So he, he wasn't too traumatized, but Jason, wait, do you see the next slide? Maureen, here we go. Okay. So, oh my God, what are and I'm, okay, I'm so, going to so show what, some real life data. Go on, Brian. So I'm seeing this as, uh, so serendipitous is now the ACE bandage of this problem. Okay, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Or not, I'm going to get to some really pretty dots um, because it is it is hard work. Um, and, and just talking about consoling the humans, which I've been doing for years, every time I present, people come up after me and they go, we thought it was just us. And it's not just you. And and, and I can tell you that I've, I don't know if, if I should name names or not, but like the biggest, hey, Tracy, the biggest tech companies in the world. Um, to the mid-sized businesses, to the small businesses, I think about sometimes who's machinating the data behind the scenes for Benioff for those ops meetings. Because you can be sure that all of those tech companies, the giants who are pushing these data-driven stories in the market are doing a lot of this behind the scenes and it all gets put into like a Google sheet or an Excel and you're told to blah, blah, blah. And you just did it last month too. And then you hit go and oh my God, somebody on the team has like broken a formula. And now it's midnight. All the functional area leaders are looking to and weeping. And then finally you just throw it over and you have the ops meeting in a PowerPoint. And then you just move on from there and never talk about it again. And this is how we deal with data. Uh, in, in, in enterprises and anybody who is in an enterprise today. So chief growth officers, whoever they're spending like 30 to 40% of their time machinating in Excel. Right. So get a little and we have, about this. Uh, Brian, we have a quick question from Thomas. Thomas says, aren't those silos a consequence of too much local decision authority? Yes. Uh, yes, it is. There's that, but the, the M&A, uh, inorganic growth is another big driver of that. Yep. A and the other all problem that, that you haven't talked about is uh, with like all the new ESG and scope three kind of requirements, you could take that graphic you've got and add like n-dimensionally deep variants of it for every supplier, every member of the, the value chain you got. So getting any of that reliable data all the way through the supply chain, is it's, got, it's just an expensive headache. Yeah, I think that would probably be the one thing that I would interject at this point too, and and we can keep this into account going forward, Maureen. But I think that a lot of the most important data for modern decision making and planning lies outside enterprise walls, and that has always been the case. But I think it's even more so now. And so you can kind of add that to the external internal problem that has never gone away is the uh, inability to really adapt that external data. And, and as Brian's referring to, it's getting more intense because now you need to know not only what your suppliers are up to, but what their suppliers are up to and how are you possibly making good decisions on all of that. So, But, well, but isn't the about... answer a data lake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Well, data just, lake house. Just, excellent, excellent. Just briefly. So you are you are correct. And we're, we're addressing that. And I won't, I won't get into it too much today. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Tracy, this is this is exactly it. Is is it is data shenanigans? Um, but part of the problem behind transformations are you have all of these exceptions, you know. So the company's going down a path, and they're going to do A, B, and C, and then you have an exec who says, "You know what? This is all great. I um, really love it. Just one thing is." So this is my weird um, exaggeration that I use. But just one thing is we've got to put cotton candy on puppies for our partner ecosystem, because if we don't, they're just they're going to flip. So so they make these exceptions and that's a Band-Aid, you know, and then there's another exception. And as we're about to see how the data is structured and categorized behind this is a huge issue, which is why. So speaking of partner ecosystem, 
um, having been a partner to companies and having to communicate in that, it is it is rare to get any kind of partner data into the system because that's an external system. And I mean, internal system data is not structured the same. How are we going to structure it to external systems? Um, so, so can we look a little bit about how the, or maybe we should solve this debate first? Yeah, this, uh, we, I mean, we, we'll, we can pick that up, but if you want to comment on it now, that's fine. You know, so the coherent strategy, I think, is really, is really important. Um, the bright and shiny object. The challenge is, and this, you know, I don't want to overly plug myself here, but we have not solved for the humans and the tech working together. Um, there are a lot of organizations worldwide. I mean, who's not working on data health worldwide from a tech and analytics perspective? And we've got a lot of programs and some tech to get humans to collaborate better, like on projects, you know, Adobe's doing that very well. What we don't have is a way for the humans and the different organizations within a company and external to a company to collaborate on data. We don't have it. Um, and I'll show a couple of examples here why, and then and we can look at that. Um, <laughs> Tracy, it's, we'll get back. To, we'll get back to that comment yeah. about jumping in too soon because that's going to tie in. I think jumping absolutely, straight in, absolutely. Jumping straight we just into haven't tech. solved for the, both those things. So, Maureen, before I before we get to your next slide, which I think are, I think these are the key slides, actually the the meat of what we're going to do today. Uh, but you said no one is looking at the granular level of how go to market data is structured, and that's critical when we're talking about AI for the enterprise. When you see this, it's mind-bogglingly clear how not prepared we are. Well, now we're going to see it. So here we go. So, so you're going to give us some examples. Here we are. Yeah. So what we do at Serendipitous is we're, we've started with the four go-to-market functional areas, product marketing, sales, and success. They all have insights the others need, but no one can get our hands on that data. And I think this is representative of, of all of the hidden problems that you have with really any sort of new technology you're applying. AI is certainly, AI is certainly like that. But I'm just going to give you, these are three real examples of three marketing reports, case studies, web, downloads, whatever. Um, so By the way, the data has been anonymized, anonymized to spare yes. to spare the pain of, yes, of certain individuals. But this is real, real world stuff here. Absolutely. And so there's a couple of things I'd like everyone to notice as we go through here. And the first one is, for God's sake, look at that top line and the data categories. So companies today exist to do ABC for the market. We're asking our customers, I'm B2B focused, so we're asking our customers to spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars for a product or a solution we've offered to them that's gonna help them solve ABC. We have no way today of figuring out how well we're doing against ABC because 25 years ago, when we started doing tech like Salesforce and marketing automation, someone somewhere designed these data categories, and these are the categories we're using today, and they give zero value to anyone beyond the vanity metrics. And they often, within a tech stack, so within product marketing, sales, or success, often the tech, the Band-Aid tech, doesn't integrate with each other or the foundational tech, and this is what people have to report on. No one's looking at this. So yeah, I, go I see this. Yeah, we'll do look at the next yeah. one, but I see this kind of thing a lot because it, Great. it's 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 this thing around that we that we have all these great analytics tools, so we want to just put stuff in there, and who no one really looks at the fact that the tools are analyzing crappy crappy content, silo data, and and a lack of engagement around it, right? Because what when I look at this, what I really want to know is. Who's looking at this and what are they asking? What are their questions? What are their concerns? I'm, I'm not getting anything here. Um, anyways, shall we move on to the next one? Yeah. Um, and that's, and, and John, you're exactly, you're exactly right there. So all of the ways that we could be um, talking about, so how, um, how are COOs in the Midwest or how are CIOs in retail or, you know, whoever we're selling to, how are these key messages that are built around how the product is built? How are they resonating? And so 
None of you really need to see the details on this. You could go in if you want to, but we've all lived one loss examples. And if you go in close, you know, again, the categories mean nothing to anybody because we've all been there when we're setting up these instances or we're modifying them and we're like, what are we supposed to say for one loss? Let's just say ghosted or price or value or team. This particular company has uh, two sets of one loss data that don't align to each other. And no, I'm not mocking these people, but when we're thinking about things like AI and we're wanting to use enterprise data, let alone the black box that LLMs are, how does that work when this is the, the you know, the bubbling vats of just rancid stuff that we're, you know, putting in pretty, in pretty dashboards? Bananas. It was interesting because at a recent show, there was this discussion that I think is a really important discussion about how uh, even transactional software companies need to be moving towards like transactions to insights, right? And and but when I look at this particular example, I see so little ability to extract any insight from this. Like the reasons for losing and the reasons for winning are basically the same. And you know, and, and I think the temptation is going to be, oh well, our AI co-pilot is going to go in and tell us like why this is wrong. But that's not going to help because the AI co-pilot can't make better sense of this than I can when I look at it and say, this doesn't make any sense. There's nothing actionable here. There, wh what do I do? Like the pricing is the reason we lose and the reason we win. Like what the hell? On that point, I've got a whole stack of stuff I've been working on, on uh, what really the future of management should be all about. And as dull as that sounds, um, you know, we haven't really thought about how you actually know, for example, if someone's a great executive manager, or whatever, the metrics for that have not really been well defined. And, and a classic example is uh, you can find with CFOs who work their people like dogs, but because they put them on salary, they have no idea how many hundred hours they're working every single week. And as a result, they can't be held accountable for the burnout and everything else if they don't have, if there's no metric that actually captures this. All we know is that people showed up and got a paycheck. We don't really know how much you know, energy they're expending and what kind of a nut job is running them. So until we get the right metrics, you know, until we can agree on the metrics, I don't even know that we can collect, you know, then we have the problem of, but do we have the data to power those metrics? those metrics. And an AI tool is not going to get you there. Not when the underlying data is gobbledygook, which is what the underlying data is in enterprises. Um, and, and, and part of that is it's a, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing if you don't do it together, because we're beating the humans um, who are being asked over and over and over again to machinate that basically the same kind of stuff and everybody in the company is just like, well, NPS is this now and it's and it's up. So, yay, or it's down. And so shouldn't we be doing more blah, blah, blah? Um, or if sales, you know, needs to up their numbers, you know, they're they're calling their sales plays like end of quarter push, which doesn't you can't tie that to anything. And it certainly doesn't it doesn't it doesn't align with mm. anything. else. So but we could but we could we could gamify it in the metaverse. Um, yeah. Anyhow. Um, so, so, so on that cheerful note, we, we have about eight minutes left in your segment. Right. And I think what we've accomplished so far is I think we've done a good job of laying out a problem statement mm -hmm. for, for what we're dealing with here. And so the challenge now is what we're going to do about it. Right. Um, because we do, yeah. we do want to, we do want to take some steps forward. And I get the sense your next slide is the beginning of that conversation. So shall we move towards that? It's the dots. Yeah, if it's the dot slide. So as we're moving to that, so this is an NPS example, same thing as the marketing reports. Okay. The way the data is categorized, categorized means nothing to anybody. And the, 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 the tying a, a bow around this is not only is the data junk in the functional areas, the data in the functional areas don't align to each other. I will point out one thing, which is that I, I like some of the unstructured comments here, even though they're very simple. And that starts to get interesting because if you have 
thousands of those unstructured comments, then AI could be interesting in terms of uh, running, sentiment analysis, run, running some sentiment on top of that, mm-hmm. stuff like that mm-hmm. would, would start to get interesting. So yes. that's one thing that catches my eye here. Yes, totally. And that's that's something that we're looking to do because because you're be, so we can go to the next slide and 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 um, all right, let's let's well, deliver some hope. You said you were okay. going to give us some hope. So now it's time. Yeah. So just a really quick story. When I was uh, in Amsterdam, this is several years ago, and I was I stumbled upon moving an on-prem CRM to the cloud. So basically went from on-prem CRM to um, a Salesforce instance and got some apps to integrate. So the thing that I stumbled upon by accident was when I started doing that, I got a lot of heat from my colleagues about the data, the eight to 10 years worth of data in their CRM that was on-prem. And so I just said, I will never touch that. I promise you, I only want to move a year or two of data over um, to this instance, freak out. What I couldn't have projected, but what I've used as a learning ever since is once we were moved and we moved a year or two of data and we were in a pretty new system that was, you know, small but building, guess how often people went back to the eight to 10 years of data? Like, never, never. So what we need to be doing, so John, this is because you you rightfully beat me on this and, and somebody else said something earlier, but, you know, nobody has an appetite right now for rip and replace or another system. I just had a prospect apologize to me up front with, I'm sorry, we probably can't add you to our tech stack. And I was like, that's great. I don't want to be added to your tech stack. So while standard transformation is going on, it needs to go on. It's important. But as it limps along, it delivers nothing of value back to the business for quite some time, if ever. What I like to see organizations doing is start small with an issue. Um, maybe it's something in a product suite where you're asking maybe three questions. You know, how are you guys doing on this today and something else? And if you were better at it, what would it deliver? But you, but you come together, product marketing, sales, and success or whatever else if you're building an AI thing, and you you start to get structured on a problem set. Um, and in four to six weeks, you've gathered data um, from siloed systems. You're starting to structure it together upstream. You got a little bit of AI in there for sentiment analysis, but some of it's just machine learning and just structuring the, the data. You've got one data set, and then your colleagues join. And by by six to nine months, You've got some pretty good data that you know the provenance of, you know the age of. It's collaborated and corroborated with your colleagues. But the point is, however you get to trustworthy data that you know the provenance of, I think it's the small data path and the recent data path um, that's going to get us to way more knowledge, whatever sort of technology you're using, than the path we have today. And I would even posit that I think when we get to 12 to 18 months, that might be an alternative path to rip and replace. And if it's not, and you've still got your same, your same foundational systems, the business leaders have data. I keep doing this like I'm doing the slope. The business leaders have data they can use and is trustworthy. Does that resonate? Is it crazy? Brian, you got that pensive look on your face. No, something good is coming. <laughs> okay. So, Maureen, what I've been thinking about the whole time is, um, Let's put some real meat on this where vendors and their software solutions don't even know anywhere close to the right kind of questions to ask, to, to let alone collect the right kind of data. But the systems they use are not smart enough to infer what is it that's, you know, that, how how upset is this customer with this, uh, you know, company they're dealing with or how happy are they really? Uh, I'm the kind of person who only gives nines or ones on an NPS score. Uh, but you really want to upset me. If I take the trouble to write a company letter and I never even get a response back on it, they're no longer a vendor of mine. And they got an yeah, NPS score of zero. They are. Dumb. Yeah. And, and in fact, Maureen, uh, ironically, I was at a vendor conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And they admitted that four years ago, their NPS score was, and I wish I had a drum roll right here, minus 51. And uh, they've been working like crazy on that, not necessarily using the data, but focusing on what they, you know, by talking to some people and learning what really were the issues, 
they're up to positive two right now. Uh, and they're still, you know, moving forward, you know, from there. I give them credit for having the guts to bring that up in an analyst meeting. But, um, boy, uh, you know, I don't think they would have figured out the path from what was in their CRM systems or revenue systems. They're not going to figure it out. They might get some clues here and there. But you got to actually take the time and talk uh, to the customers to find out what's really going on. And you need you need people that actually are savvy enough to know how to read people on the other side of the table and keep asking all those probative questions. One of the best things in my career I learned at Accenture was we always sent staffers in to go interview top executives of companies. Why? Because the staffers could get away with asking the why question like five and six times in a row until they actually got to the real root issue of what's going on here. And I thought that was always a fantastic deal. So yes, uh, the data in and of itself isn't going to get it. Uh, not in my mind. Yeah, the human piece is really important. Um, and that is something that is hard for us to get across to investors. But is um, I had a prospect say to me at a giant tech company last week, she was like, oh, my God, the humans and the tech, that's like a, a gentle hug for my brain. Um, but if we're not willing at enterprise, and it's hard because of the cognitive overload that people working in enterprise are dealing with. But if we're not willing to retrain our brains a little bit and, and open up the conversations, it's the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, it's just chaos continues to ensue until we can get some new energy in there. And that's second, what to do. Second law of thermodynamics. I didn't sign up for that on this call. Did you, John? <laughs> but anyway. I'm not going to be hitting the books tonight, I can tell you that. But one thing I will one thing I will say that I think is really interesting, Maureen, is that I spent a decent amount of time in the cloud ERP mid-market. And one thing that I like about doing that is that some of these companies don't have as complex a legacy landscape. And so I get to see what's possible when there's less of that and when they migrate into a more like a platform that has a lot of their most important data. But the interesting thing is that even there, there's a problem, which is that the vendors often think that it's about the go live, whereas the go live is just getting that platform organized. And then it's the opportunity to try to make sense of things. And, and, and that's where I'm always pushing customers to say, that's where the real value is. It's not on the fact that you went from 16 versions of QuickBooks to one financials platform. That's just the beginning of the opportunity. Yeah. That's, 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 that's barely getting started. And talking with one customer this spring was interesting because and I think this fits into your point around like you pick a focused area where you either have data quality or where data quality is achievable in a fairly short term context, and then you can move on that. And in this case, it was about profitability. And it, what they found is that the law, this was a construction company, the large projects that they signed that everyone congr high fives in the office, we signed this huge deal. They weren't their most profitable projects. And in fact, it was their more modest scope projects where there aren't handshakes and smiles that were actually generating more profitability by far. And so you say, okay, well, that that's cool. But you think about it, all the steps that it took for them to get there because they had to know the right questions to ask. They had to trust that data as a single source of truth. They had to be willing to ask a counterintuitive question. They had to be willing to accept the the data from that, which might not actually be the data that you really wanted to hear uh, because it changes how they think about sales and deals and high fives in the office. So even though it's a fairly simple example, it shows you, I think, underneath the surface, there's a lot there from a cultural standpoint that you have to be ready, right, in order to embrace that. Yeah, and we we in particular, because I've lived this at so many different companies on both sides of the Atlantic, I, I knew that we had to uh, to build that learning piece in. I hesitate to call it learning. So we've got the the um we've got that you know wedded together and your thing about the go live and tracy's point about the go live i think the and and getting back to the rube goldberg and the puzzles and the band-aids i think the worst thing we do in tech today in the vendor ecosystem i'm part of that is we're terrible at onboarding we onboard folks and then the vendor goes away nobody's looking at utilization and seeing if they're doing it right and then that customer churns and people are like oh they're churning cuz of product and they're they're generally probably churning because they weren't onboarded appropriately but we're not paying enough attention to the how the humans interact with the tech final questions and comments for marine from the chat please put them in now our special guest segment will be ending shortly brian any uh, anything you wanted to get to 
I thought Tracy's earlier comments about where somehow she wove in data shenanigans and magical oh um, yeah, yeah, let's see unicorns. I thought was a fascinating combination. I've never seen that in the comment section before. Oh, there we yeah. go. Okay, you found it. Um, Magic and unicorns are run by data shenanigans and data entry. Yeah, and so, and somebody had data swamp in there instead of a data lake or data lake house. So uh, kudos. It's true. That's, that's all the way around. True. Well, you you could argue that OpenAI was built on data shenanigans on the backs of of humans who have hundred percent who have never been compensated. So, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, you had to get a nice slam in on OpenAI before the show's well over. So that felt felt good. Maureen, any final comments as you go through this material? This is it's possible. It is, it's possible, and we have got to start looking at how the tech and the humans work together. We can't keep continue to be shoving stuff on the humans. It doesn't work for us. Yeah, and one of the things I think about with that I think works well to the kind of projects you're describing is I think these, it's not that transformation products aren't important. It's just that you have to now think about it like every two to three months when the board asks me what business results we're getting, I need to have an answer. And it's got to be a new answer. And ideally, these kinds of projects would help give you that answer because you could go and say, yes, we did this. We built this new, we solved this data question. We made this adjustment on go to market based on it. Like you have to have those fresh answers all the time now. And 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 a fresh answer is not, oh, we saved 20% by moving to the cloud and reduced our TCO and, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And no one wants to hear that anymore. Yeah. Uh, if I could extend Maureen's kind of stuff here. What I've been struck with is the the use of AI in a lot of the new applications we're seeing out there is it further erodes the amount of work that people have to do on just regular transaction processing. And it's supposed to be helping shift people to provide more insight, but you're not going to be able to do that with the junk for data that's out there in a lot of cases. But I wonder, is the workforce really ready to uh, provide insights up to you know up and down management and everything else and across the organization if they don't know how to if they don't know how to actually pick up the phone and like talk to customers talk to suppliers whatever and see if the data and the experience or whatever that's being related verbally whatever is aligning and matching up because if you're going to be able to talk to the top execs of your own company and explain what's going on you've got to do the primary some primary research. And I'm not sure that it was actually happening anywhere. People are trying to divine brilliant insights out of uh, erroneous data in the first place. That's not where you go to get to get the best knowledge. And to be fair, yeah, that- the execs are focused on the wrong thing. And we've talked about this on, on your show before. But uh, it, it can often be really challenging, even if you have great data to persuade them beyond something like, you know, do more sales plays. We need different SEOs. Stop the sprint because big customer wants us to do blah, blah, blah. I mean, that is the reality in enterprise as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maureen, I just have one more question, final thing for you, and then we'll wrap, which is when you go into organizations and 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 work with them on these projects, when they actually go forward, to what extent do you need like, do you need broad executive buy-in? Do you need, do you need just one executive one to take a chance? Can you work with a small team of change agents on a project level, even if the executive team isn't sold on this yet? Like how how much buy-in do you need in order to get started? Well, because this is a little bit of shadow IT um, and it's and it's affordable. Uh, so we go in at the leadership level, so like ahead of a functional area. Um, but what often happens is we'll go in with a forward thinking person and that's who we're targeting. It could be any of the functional areas. So you might hear like you might be in with a head of product and they'll go, this is really great. We want to do this head of success. We'll never do. You're in with head of success. They're like, this is great. We want to do sales is never got. So somebody you have blockers and you have change agents and you can move forward with the change agents because the data that comes out of it is valuable to everyone. And that's when they start to lean in. Got it. That's how you get the laggards. Got it. Cool. So yeah, find, finding finding change agents inside of organizations. I love that. And then building momentum with those. That makes makes a lot of sense. Maureen, Perfect. always a pleasure. Thank you for dropping the Thanks, knowledge and, and, the, and the hard won project lessons. Thanks for being a female founder and kicking some ass out there and, and keep doing it. it. Keep doing it. 
look forward to checking back in with you in the future. See you soon. Bye all. Okay. Brian Marine drop the knowledge. That was cool. Well, I like the fact she dropped knowledge and not a mic, uh, you know, so uh, yeah, indeed. Indeed. Well, um, I don't know if we fixed the enterprise today, but that's never our goal. Um, we, we do well, have, it put, us out, it put me out of business if we did, but go ahead. Yeah. We, we do have, a uh, we do have a whiff. Yeah. Yeah. I had a hard time resisting the, the AI priest who was quickly defrocked for giving users, um, poor answers to their spiritual questions. My friend Clyde Bolton's comment, um, forgive me, father, for I'm a sim. That is like, <laughs> that's like Las Vegas stand up quality stuff. Oh yeah, that was a that, good one. Uh, thanks, Thomas, for being here. Appreciate you provoking the chat as usual. Thank you. Mm, appreciate it, Thomas. Um, yeah, yeah. So anyway, it seems like every every week there's another one of these things, and you know the the thing about it is that when you put something out into the wild like that, there's no accountability. So you can throw it out there, and it can do some say some stupid shit, and and then it, then life moves on. The enterprise has a higher bar than that most of the time, which I think is good. But anyway, these whiffs are certainly a delight nonetheless. I think we ought to get that priest to uh, be at some software conferences and have uh, integrators go in there and software salespeople confess their sins to him and see what kind of penance he recommends. But that's just an idea. Anyhow, keep going. Indeed. By the way, uh, these whiffs are generally pulled from my uh, highlights from my weekly Enterprise Hits and Misses columns. And Brian actually just posted... Uh, a big long article I've had a chance to read about how customers should be pressing vendors with a whole new set of questions. I'm looking forward to reading that. Brian, this next whiff was actually kind of from you. You sent me, uh, I said, I pride myself on receiving some of the wackiest PR pitches, but I think you kind of taught me there. I, I've I've uh, sent a few over your way lately that uh, I know didn't hit your inbox. And I don't know why I'm being targeted for some of these beauties, but this one, you know, uh, with the, the uh, home garden, whatever they wanted an expert to talk about uh, septic tanks, and I thought that was right up your alley instead of mine. Thanks, but, man, uh, I appreciate it, man. Sharing the love, sharing the pitches, man. This that's beautiful. Thanks. Uh, no question about it. And yeah. uh, the next one, I think, also uh, referenced you. Um, oh, it did. Oh yeah, this one. Hi. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. This one I saw. It has <laughs> nothing to do with technology, but I thought getting you know you should go to the Lance Bass In Sync uh, Ultimate Dance class. I thought that would really you know if there's anything that is going to increase your street cred and maybe get you some keynote action, you yeah, know, at some of the tech conferences. Just think of playing some In Sync music in the background. You come dancing out, do the mic drop right there on stage. Yeah, you'll you'll be the analyst du jour for sure. Anyway. Hey, man, maybe I could be a motivational speaker someday. Although I will say I'm a little more on the backstreet boys than In Sync, so that's one small issue I would have, have there. But okay, something that inspires creates value. That means we're at the end because we put our, have to put ourselves on the spot now to to say something uplifting and inspirational to close our program. What you got, Brian? Well, um, I'm going to say this. I had to, I had to eat, eat some crow here lately because I was tough on a vendor. And uh, I know you find that hard to believe, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm shocked. Uh, but it made me go back and really rethink something uh, tying up to the point you, you article I just published that um, you mentioned. I had to think about how we're actually looking at software, how people are buying it. And I realized we've gone through a very fundamental shift when we start dealing with platforms and AI and a couple other advanced technologies today. And it just opens up a multitude of new issues that companies are going to have to look at. And uh, that's not necessarily a problem, but what it is, it's a, you know, for the smart uh, listeners, here's an opportunity to really change, radically change the way you're going to procure this kind of technology, because there's a whole bunch of new questions, things that you need to put in your RFI and your RFP that you haven't thought about before. And Okay. And uh, what happened here? What was that one? Oh, well, Thomas is just saying we'll never run out of whiffs, which is fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> never run out of whiffs. 
Well, and Brian, what do you think about this too, that that one aspect of AI is that it's provoking this data conversation that has really needed to happen for a long time. You know, I mean, it's been happening, but it's happening a little more intensely now. Um, yeah, I think the problem that Maureen is, is addressing ha- would still be here, if, even if AI wasn't, uh, you know, the big topic sure. du jour. Uh, it's been around a long time. It hasn't gotten frankly, that much better. And, uh, and as long as we have, a, you know, there's, I don't know why, but lately I've collected a lot of clients who are in the inorganic growth way, uh, mode of uh, expansion. And they have all of these problems that uh, Maureen was talking about. So it wasn't AI was not the trigger, uh, but certainly it's putting a shining a very bright light on you're not going to get the value out of AI if you got junk for for data back there. In fact, I, I'd love to know, I don't know how old that expression garbage in, garbage out is, but I heard Gigo when the early 80s, when I started my career in this space, and it probably preceded me by quite a bit before that. So not new, but definitely some new twists on it. Yeah, I think for myself, just briefly, I think it this type of stuff inspires me to just try to be better and better at what I do because, you know, that kind of change is a little unpredictable and you want to be on top of it. And and there's so much need for precision in how we use these terms and what they mean right now. And so that gives me lots of learning and lots of chances to try to get better and smarter. And I really like that about the current thing. And that was one reason why I picked that critical thinking article because I was like, yeah, we need critical thinkers. We need people who can... And that doesn't mean just like kind of criticizing other people's product ideas, but it means like saying, here's something we need to account for that we haven't thought of. Here's a question like to your most recent piece. Here's a question that customers should need to be asking. It's that kind of thing. And so anyway, I think to me, that's inspiring. I hope it is for everyone else because otherwise, you know, I think it would just feel like just endless tech hype and that's not fun. So Tracy says we can only automate what we standardize indeed. Which, br- which brings me to the problem of overrated AI agent talk, which is automagical automation of workflows. Yeah, keep, keep, keep telling yourself that. But that's a topic for another show, Brian, because we do this once a month, so we can pick up that next time. And if anybody ever wants to send uh, either one of us some suggestions for th- stupid stuff, uh, the whiffs, or on the... Uh the weird new made up word of the month that someone, some other vendor has uh, started pushing out the market. Love to have them. Uh, you know, uh, if anything, even if it's really great, I'll save it for the uh, unpredictions uh, piece that we do every Indeed. year in December. All right. Well, All I think right. We, well, I think we're at a rep point, John. We are. Let's quit while we're behind. And we got a bunch of shows coming up. So next time y'all see us, we'll have a bunch of fresh stuff. And thanks to our excellent chat members. You guys raised the conversation once again. Glitter and unicorns, Tracy, indeed. <laughs> we got to be ready. We're going to see a lot more of those. Uh, <laughs> Data shenanigans. Yeah. Indeed. So thanks all. Great to see you. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.